after evening noon o'clock and welcome to deep space and dragons i'm richard first on the title card uh and and i'm carl and unfortunately also on on the list but not first and and welcome to our show so what's new in the carlverse today uh well you know i was hanging out with my uh, with my roommate uh, looking for bad movies to watch on Netflix, like you do. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, let's uh, let's watch this movie called Kill Them All. Because you know, I remember that was it was a pretty mediocre movie, but you know, it'd be kind of fun to rewatch it, see if it was actually as bad as I thought it was. Uh, look for it. It's like, oh, yeah, it's still on there. Read the description and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, it's definitely the movie that I remember. It starts playing, and Jean-Claude Van Damme goes, comes on screen. It's like, wait, what? I don't remember Jean-Claude Van Damme being in this movie. So we watched this movie, and uh, it it was not a good movie. It was uh, well, that it was, was like deliberate. a heist movie. To be fair, it was, that was <laughs> deliberate. But continue. Uh, <laughs> but so because um, <clears throat> it was kind of like it was kind of like a, a heist movie, like um, like the Usual Suspects. Is, is pretty much the, the classic to compare it to because it's like the interrogation with, with the twist ending where it turns out that the character you at least expect is the one who's guilty. Ooh. Uh, except, you know, their FBI only interrogate one person and there was no need for this, like, twist ending. And regardless, get to the end of the movie uh, and then realize that, um, it's just another movie called Kill Them All. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I, just, I, did a, I, just, I did a Google search when you mentioned the story, and the first thing that popped up is the album by Metallica, which does sound like a good time worth watching like a movie for an hour. <laughs> but but it, it was just weird, because then we go back to the, to the search screen, uh, and we're looking at it, it's like the description for the movie, when, when you search for it, is not the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. It's the other movie, the one that I watched last time. Uh, but you actually go to watch it, and it's like, nope, you're watching this newer Jean-Claude Van Damme movie, which is, uh, well... Are you sure this isn't a Bernstein... It be a heist movie, but there was no crew. I'm just going to put this out there. Are you sure this isn't a Bernstein Bear situation where some time traveler changed something slightly and you got a different movie? <laughs> Well, see, the problem is that the description that Netflix has for the movie is from the older movie. Yeah, like, that means your time traveler. Kill, kill them all. <laughs> that means your time, the traveler, time traveler screwed up. Right when he was, right when this time traveler went back in time and gave John Claude Van Damme bad career advice, is when you clicked play on this movie. So it was the previous movie you remembered up until the instant you clicked play when the timeline shifted and they got replaced by another movie. To the point where if you go and look up the description now, it's probably been changed to this new movie. Because you caught it mid-timeline shift. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Or maybe they were just uh, movies that didn't do that well and they didn't really bother updating their search engine properly. I mean, if you want to be boring, sure. Let's just use facts and logic. (laughs) <laughs> so, what's factually new with you, uh, Richard? So, my mother came to visit for ten days over the holidays, which now dated this episode. I apologize if I just ruined your perceptive of sign and broke your suspension of disbelief in the mid-fall when you're watching this video. But... Well, you never know. Maybe maybe, maybe she came over for ten days to celebrate uh, Valentine's Day, which would be weird to celebrate with your mom, but go on. I mean... I watched enough Hallmark movies over the redacted holiday period that I would not be surprised if a premise of a movie was your chocolate shop was failing on Valentine's Day and your family came to help you out for 10 days. You'd call it like the advent to Valentine's or something. But moving on from millions of Hallmark movies ideas and just all their countless glory. So what's new with me is I had a very casual family holiday visit time. That lasted for 10 days, and my social energy has been burnt to a crisp. Also, burnt to a crisp. Also, I've been working on a new project on mine, as you bring up murder mysteries, and I may have been up till 6 in the morning trying to create a believable web of events for a murder mystery. 
And I will say, whodunits can be one of the trickiest things to actually put together, and it's required the most research of some of a project of mine by a pretty fair margin. Because mm. the hard part isn't who, figuring out who done it and then leaving a trail of breadcrumbs for the readers to follow. It's how to make every single character you want to appear suspicious appear suspicious. Because mm. if you don't think that other people could be suspects, then there's no thrill in it. But if it doesn't feel like the, anyone could be suspects, there's no thrill in it. You have to make everyone just that little bit guilty. Also, mm. I watched Cobra Kai till four in the morning. But... <laughs> To be fair, that has fantastic music. A truly... I'm hesitant to say that Cobra Kai is stupid entertainment, because there is some substance there, but it's also stupid entertainment, which is what you expect for a series hmm. based on the Karate Kid. Although, I think it's just clearly the superior product. But our topic... Clearly really the superior product? Okay. But... One other thing that's noteworthy in the Richard verse is I did put the Waltz of Blades on sale for 30% off for the month of January. So if you're listening to it, this episode this month, go in, get your copy, and if you sign up for my newsletter, there's a 15% off coupon in there for you. So if for some reason me trying to give away free copies at the end of this video and you're still sleeping on this, buy a copy, then I can buy myself a coffee, maybe one of those little flavor syrup pumps. It's living the dream. <laughs> and with that, let's move into today's, uh, or tonight's, you know what? I'm going to say to Wen's, to Wen's topic, murder mysteries, or the who duns the duns it. So, I'll start by asking you a straightforward one. What is, other than this heist movie you watched where they forgot to assemble a crew, what was the last mystery, or via murder or otherwise, that you watched? Um, well, I mean, it was probably, uh, Knives Out was the last mystery that I, that I watched and or read. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I was actually gonna, gonna ask you, uh, um, more along the lines of, like, uh, like, mystery, mysterious, and all you, know, obviously they go hand in hand. Uh, but, like... What would you say are are the defining characteristics of a of a mystery versus like a like a thriller uh, or a horror that's like more about like suspense than than slasher and gore? See, that's a very interesting point. So during my morning bubble bath, I had a very lengthy internal monologue about whether or not the last police if a police procedural counts as a who done it. Because I recently mm. went through, well, Knives Out is the most recent murder mystery I watched, followed by the classic Clue movie, which, for the record, I'm not sponsored by the Clue movie. I have no stake in the Clue movie. Go watch the Clue movie. It is fantastic. Or stay and watch the Clue movie. Find it on YouTube if you must. <laughs> but to warp your question around a bit and get back to it, most of my experience is like seasons of Bones and things where you have one villain show up in an episode. You have your detectives find the clues. There's usually one misleader, a second one. There's usually a romantic mm. subplot between two of your characters bouncing back and forth between this murder mystery. And then at the end of the episode, you wrap it up. Where the mm. show Lucifer about the literal angel from hell doing celestial things was as core a police procedural. But when we look at Knives Out and Clue... Those aren't police procedurals. They're not just a detective trying to solve a mystery. There's a lot of overlap, but I think the difference comes down to the number of characters and the number of suspects. Where to have a good whodunit, I think you have to have like a fully populated clue board. Where to be a murder mystery, you need to have at least six players, ideally color-coded. <laughs> well, the color-coded players are, are, are just... Uh... An easy visual identifier for for readers or watchers. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a technique that that is used in multiple genres. Uh, most notably, uh, that's like one of the the check marks of of a Marvel movie is that you know the villains and the heroes are all color coded. Is it's just visually simple to follow and understand, and especially in the case of a of a whodunit where there's lots of moving parts. Uh, having characters that are easily recognizable uh 
makes it easier for the any audience member to follow and be like, ah, you know, it, it was Mr. Plum in the library with the candlestick. Well, it's kind of like <laughs> Knives Out kind of inverted the formula where it gave you the who did it early on and it was more about the specifics of how and why and whether they'd get caught. But mm -hmm. I will say, they didn't color code their characters and I remembered everyone be via their association or their amount mm. of Chris Evans rather than the character's <laughs> actual names. Like, the one character was 100% Chris Evans, easy to follow. And then it was Chris Evans' brother, Chris Evans' aunt, Chris Evans' nephew. And thus, by using the Chris Evans system, you were able to identify who everyone was. <laughs> Fair enough. Where Clue, with his straight-up color-coded names, was fantastic. But I'm, mm. but murder mysteries are interesting for what we'd actually declare one, because Sherlock Holmes, for example, has murder mysteries. But I don't know if every Sherlock Holmes book would be a murder mystery. And many of the movies, if not all of the movies, are actually spy movies that happen to have Sherlock Holmes rather than traditional whodunits. Ooh, yeah, the the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies are definitely uh, leaning way more in, in, like the. I would go not, as far as to really call them a James mysteries. Bond. They're a James Bond movie set in contemporary London. Yeah, yeah. Which I mean, I mean I'm not about to pick a fight with Robert Downey Jr. fans. I just simply do not have the military might required. <laughs> but okay, uh, but so would you say like a heist movie is a subcategory of mystery? I would disagree. Well, not really. Yeah, because a heist movie is not. However, I think it would count if a whodunit if the... It's, I think the whodunit is the framing. To be a whodunit, you need X number of suspects with a detective trying to solve the mystery and it's mystery that needs to be solved. So to make a heist movie into a whodunit, what you would do is you would have all the people guilty of the heist in a room. Mm. And then you'd mm. have the detective determine who did the heist and why because the whodunit doesn't have to be a murder. It could be who stole what. Right. So, to, for a heist movie to be a whodunit, you'd theoretically have to show the heist at the end of the movie rather than the start or the core of it. Or show pieces of it fragmented throughout. And let the, you, having the viewer piece together the mystery and be satisfied when it pieced together is a key part of a whodunit. Weirdly, the second season of Bleach shoved a whodunit in there, and I actually think <laughs> they clicked all the boxes. Because they introduced their 13 characters, which, in both their numbered episodes episode, and our episode on Bleach, and our episode on Dragon Ball, and our episode on pretty much all of them at some point have complained about Bleach doing this. But, <laughs> for the purposes of a murder mystery, introducing 13 characters at once with brief descriptions, and then slowly over a season having this murder mystery play out in the background, is the one justifiable reason to add 13 characters at once. Because having mm -hmm. recently went through that season of Bleach, you don't know who killed Captain Aizen, but actually with me knowing that Aizen responsible for literally everything, including the theme music, you cut it off one time in the middle of an attack. <laughs> but knowing that he faked his own death beforehand and then watching the murder mystery play out, it was actually pretty well written. Like, you wouldn't be able to guess that he killed himself based on the information they give you on these characters. But it made sense right. when it happened. To the point where they retconned that effectively that his bullshit superpowers, how he did it. But honestly, re-watching it where he's like, oh yeah, I made sure that my love interest found my dead body at the same time as the person who I framed for killing me so they'll fight so no one will pay attention to my body so I can switch it out with a fake. Was actually some pretty good murder mystery nonsense. And didn't actually <laughs> require the superpowers to have... Effectively, his plan was to get as many people fighting each other as possible so he could steal the diamond. So, as far as murder mysteries go, that was actually a successfully written murder mystery. Hmm. <clears throat> Even if it had uh, nothing to do with the main characters or the plot, because the character solving the murder mystery was detectiving it, was not actually a core member of the cast. It was blue haired big spiky kid. White-haired big spiky kid? <laughs> Uh, I think he has white and blue hair. He probably was supposed to be silver-haired, uh, but... But metallics don't translate well to digital color palettes? No, though, they do not. So to follow up on that one, 
what is the last thing you've seen other than Knives Out or Clue that had a mur murder mystery just kind of thrown in there? Because a lot of shows will just <laughs> have a whodunit episode. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> see, like lately I've been watching a lot more like like fantasy or um, like superhero movies and uh, the superhero movies um, a, who, a whodunit definitely requires much much more nuance than than the plot and writing of most superhero movies I will say uh, there's been a couple Batman movies I've seen like animated Batman ones that do are straight up whodunits like there's one I watched mm. that was like Batman Hush was effectively a who did it and all the suspects were effectively every Batman villain you could think of. Uh, the Batman Assault on Arkham? Had some uh, which was like moments. the Suicide Squad? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if, if, you, if you enjoyed Suicide Squad, but for some reason haven't seen Batman Arkham, Assault on Arkham, uh, it's just a better animated version of Suicide Squad. Not to be confused Although, with the Suicide Squad. <laughs> I was I was going to say, it should, should not be confused with the Suicide Squad. <laughs> oh. So, one of my little side projects I'm working on right now is helping one of my classmates edit their epic fantasy novel. And it starts with... It's kind of like there's a murder mystery in it, but it's almost a Knives Out approach where you as the reader have a pretty good idea who did it. But then you know mm -hmm. that if they get caught, the entire thing collapses, but you also know you're missing a lot of information. And when I got to the very end of the book, they reshowed the scene, but basically did it from like 10 seconds earlier from when the book started to show they're like missing 10 seconds of what happened. Mm. And I think that still qualifies as a very solid whodunit, where if you know how it ends, but you're missing some vital piece of information and then give that right. information throughout the series, you're good to go. This wasn't the core driving force of the book, however. It was just, like, the beginning and the end were this murder mystery, and then an entire Lord of the Rings happens in the middle. <laughs> uh, but, so, like, you kind of briefly touched on, like, crime dramas, and it's, uh, like, um... <clears throat> do you... So I th do you think that it's just that, like, crime dramas are generally too formulaic with the way that they function, or, like... I think it's that, and this is going to be a weird critique, so feel free to call me out on this. I think it's because they're too short of individual plot mm. arcs. So an episode mm. of Bones, individual, will be like, I found a dead body, I figured out what injured them, I pieced together, this person was the culprit because of a radio disfracture, blah, 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 blah. I'm not, a, I'm mm. not educated enough to fully mimic Bones back to people. Or if we're watching an episode of Lucifer and they're like, I'm gonna use, I'm a detective, but my superpower is I make people tell me their desires. And we have a buddy cop comedy. And it's like, the thing about those is they can become whodunits if you have enough suspects and enough clues for the reader to actually have time to piece it together before it happens in a satisfying mm. way. So if you have a mm -hmm. six episode long, like, cis suspects and you narrow them down one by a time, you hit a murder mystery or a who's done it. If there's only two suspects, you have a who's done it, but it's such a microcosm that you're now a police procedural because that used up more of the screen time than the who done it. I think. Well, like, okay, but so then, like, if we pivot kind of towards a less realistic show, like, say, uh, I don't know if you ever watched the Dresden Files or read the books, but uh, I mean, it's kind of a supernatural. Uh, he's a supernatural detective. Or, uh, or something like Supernatural, where they're not exactly supernatural detectives, but a lot of mysterious things go on, and there's a, a, a concurrent uh, plot that goes on in the background of, of what's actually going on and how they're okay. How so they for Supernatural, find the source and stop it, right? Oh man, do I have thoughts on Supernatural? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna push some of those thoughts down deep inside my soul to fester and die, and focus on the topic at hand. The first couple seasons of Supernatural were actually a whodunit, because mm. their mom was killed by a demon, their dad mysteriously left, and they were trying to piece together what happened. However, mm -hmm. the problem with your whodunits, and to a lesser extent Death Note, is once you've solved <laughs> the whodunit, then you're just adding crap to keep your show going, because you've solved it. So 99% mm. of Supernatural fans will be like, oh yeah, if they ended at season 4 after they'd solved the whodunit. 
that was great. But instead, they're like, now we're going to add 12 seasons of the heterosexual life partner Sam and Dean and their occasional third wingman, the angel Castiel. Castian? Castian. Oop. Castiel? Castian? It's been a while since I've Supernatural. I'm sure I just angered a decent portion. Non, a non-unsubstantial portion of the internet by getting that name wrong. <laughs> but my point is that, yeah, Supernatural was a whodunit. But once it became the mm. uh, stop being mysterious about what happened, the later seasons were Dean is now, I guess, marked by the original sin and is a demon, I guess. And they weren't like trying to solve anything so much as just deal with problems thrown at them in their setting. Much like how the first Death Note wasn't a whodunit, but it was a mystery suspense. And the mystery was more like on the person of L, where all the mystery tropes of he's trying to use his evidence to logically guide through and figure out who the murderer is, and it followed the Nyabout's approach of, we know instantly that Light is the murderer in Death Note, spoilers for 20-year-old anime, but <laughs> the real mystery was him trying to like cover his tracks while L tried to find the evidence to bring him down. But once that core arc was solved, there's a season 2 to Death Note. I feel like one in five Death Note fans kept watching after L died. Because mm. you killed your dual antagonist. And that was where the interest that's where the interest came from. Okay. Um so I mean <clears throat> you kinda glazed over the Dresden files, which is actually uh, interesting. Like I said, it's a supernatural uh mystery well. It's described as a balance of fantasy and a hard-boiled detective fiction following the main character, Harry Dresden, a private investigator and wizard who investigates supernatural disturbances in modern-day Chicago. I mean, there's a lot of keywords in there that I enjoy. I have not, however, <laughs> taken the time to sit down and read them. I've seen a Yeah, few well, I mean, apparently there's 17 novels set in the Dresden Files universe. Mm -hmm. Whew. And I feel like a lot of these those novels are probably a standalone story. Mm. Because that's what works best for Who Duns It, unless you're really committed to your Who Has Done It. Because let's take My Hero Academia as a weird example. So mm -hmm. early in the show, they mentioned that one of these 30 class members is a traitor. Mm. And it was so irrelevant that it got revealed last week, like five or six years after the fact. And I honestly <laughs> think most people forgot there was a traitor. <laughs> Because you're who that done it, if there's no, like, suspects and people aren't acting shady, mm -hmm. you have no reason to even realize it's a who had done it or care. And I'm not going to spoil who the traitor was, because it was it turned out to be ultimately irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Like in Naruto, when they're like, who's the masked man? It's like, it's Kakashi's squad mate. They have symmetrical matching eyes with the same superpowers. Also has the same hair and body type. It was this guy! Shocking twist! Like, your mystery wasn't a mystery. You need well, multiple and suspects. The, the, yeah, that, that's kind of the the other thing too. Is it, is like, oh, who is this guy? But they didn't actually give us any other suspects to be suspicious of. Mm -hmm. Like, who else could it have been? I mean, e e even actually, the fact that it was was uh, Kakashi's dead squad mate, uh, it's like the the reveal had no impact because. I wasn't suspecting anyone else. I wasn't really suspecting anyone else. I was like, yeah, well, like... It's kind of funny, because back in my Cineplex days, I managed to get most of the staff into watching Naruto through my charisma and playing Naruto fighting games on movie theater screens. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple people try and argue about, like, other options of who it could be. Like, this debate actually happened. Mm -hmm. But, as I mentioned, the show had no intention of pursuing other leads so it did not manage to sneak a who had done it or a murder mystery or a legit mystery into it and to loop back around to marvel movies uh, so oh, uh, essentially what you're what you're uh, so what you're suggesting is that the the who done it slash murder mystery uh <clears throat> is uh the number of leads that are pursued. Most TV show formats are just too short to pursue enough leads to make it a compelling mystery. Correct. 
I think it's to be a compel to be a mystery, you have to give enough options for it to be mysterious. The X Files was objectively a mystery because it wasn't mm. a who had done it because you're not following multiple leads. Instead, they use the approach of limited information, where they never gave you enough information in any one episode of the X Files to piece together everything that had happened in that episode of the X Files. So it's hard to mm. decide what. Like, I honestly think that the X Files actually falls closer into suspense than it does mystery because of the aforementioned lack of leads. But it definitely set up a good, mm -hmm. mysterious environment. It had the tone and atmosphere of a mystery. Because a lot of things like light direction, art, sound choices, background music can give something the feel of a mystery. And that feel can be just as important as having a compelling mystery. Well, okay, I mean, so then now you're getting into a visual medium versus the, the written medium, because it's like... Um, I am not. A lot so, of, say, like Stephen King... I'm going to stop um, you right there. If you genuinely mm -hmm. believe that when someone writes a book, they don't have control over the visual tone, the feelings, the ambiance, a large part of writing style is making those visual elements come across in written text. By your word choice, your what? word patterns, your rhythms... You can do everything a TV show can do in written medium. And in fact, the most successful ones do, in fact, do that. <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, I guess specifically the keyword I picked up on was uh, the music. That's kind you, of a... You just can't have music in your book. But you can definitely put in what you... I kind of disagree, weirdly. A lot of, like, the way you space words and sounds can actually give almost a musical quality to writing. Like, if you sit and read mm. some Edgar Allan Poe, like, for example, The Raven, by use of M's ashes, spacing, line structure, he actually makes it so those physical shape of the text makes you read faster and faster, creating a tempo, and specifically alternate sounds in that tempo to build a soundtrack to the book. Mm. I have very much recently written a paper on specifically how he did that. <laughs> so yeah okay songs are based on poetry poetry is words and a lot of our music even the non-instrumental <laughs> stuff is tied to how you structure those units of sound and a book mm. is just an assortment of symbols to represent units of sound yeah okay sorry for that passionate tangent but uh, well no I mean that, that was worth worth following because, like, uh, like you say, the particularly in in movies, uh, if you try to watch a movie without the soundtrack, uh, the, the writing very rarely carries the emotional impact of the scenes. What's kind of fascinating for a uh, book is a lot of writers will listen to music that specifically invokes a mood, and I have a theory, and this mm -hmm. hasn't been proven in any way, shape, or form. But I feel like the way you space your words and the way you write will almost get bent by the music you're listening to. Because mm. if you're just ca typing, listening to mysterious, royalty-free fantasy music, and it's like, do 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 do, your sentence will probably be short and bitey. And then you'll go short sentence, short sentence, longer one with three commas for the dramatic flourish, then short, short again. Like, I feel like you'll almost mm. fall into a rhythmical pattern. Because you're letting rhythm influence you while you're creating. In theory. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's definitely very clear that the audio cues do influence your mood, and your mood will definitely influence your, your writing to an extent. Because, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, a lot of writing is about practicing and finding your style and your voice. Uh, but then, you know, you also need to, uh, make sure that your style and voice will try to match the, the, the genre you're trying to present because like a Stephen King novel, uh, is very mysterious, but then most often gets categorized as horror because like, you know, there's like weird aliens killing people or like. I don't know. Like it's, it's like they add fantasy tropes to uh, to contemporary mur murders or crime dramas. Yeah, like the big difference as what we kept getting at, and what 
I think you're trying to get me to say through some of your questions in a way, was to be a murder mystery, it's not just you have to do the Marvel movie checkbox. So much of it is tone and that you're trying to be mm. a mystery. Where you could take the mm. exact plot of a mystery and turn it into John Wick instead, if instead of having characters try and piece things together slowly and carefully and figure out the story, you instead have Keanu Reeves gun fu his way through every suspect. Yeah, I suppose uh, you could definitely just uh, brute force your way through a mystery instead of actually gracefully trying to solve it by interrogating suspects and follow. Like, I can say from complete certainty, having run <laughs> Water Deep Dragon Heist, several aspects of it were designed to be mysteries, with suspects listed in the book, for things to be discussed, for people to piece together what had happened. It was actually closer to a mystery than a heist, because you were trying to figure out mm. what the heist was that had happened, because a bomb just blows up on your doorstep. So, my party mostly blackmail, extorted, and paid people. And there was no actual mm -hmm. solving of this mystery. They didn't care who did it. They were just going to open a bakery instead and move on with their lives. <laughs> like, not the twist you're expecting. You like, you would think, like, oh, no, yeah, they probably just went and attacked all four crime fam. No, they really just opened a bakery and wanted to retire peacefully. These characters had no <laughs> desire to go on adventures. <laughs> Yeah, that is true. Uh, the end of that mystery was literally just all the adventurers retire. I mean, one adventurer <laughs> did win D and D, but moving on from that, I think it's time for us to go to our random question and random dragon question of the week for your chance to win a digital copy of the Waltz of Blades Deluxe, also currently on sale. Feel free to check out my various Twitter social medias and there'll be a link in the video description. If you manage to click it within the next month, the sale will still be going. Alright, so here's first up our random dragon question of the week. If a dragon came to you for help, what do you think they would want help with? Uh, <clears throat> well, if a dragon came to me for help, what do I think they would want help with? I I feel like uh, a dragon would probably need a lot of help moving. Like he's got a lot of stuff to move. He's got a lot of stuff to pack up and categorize. Like he like yeah he knows all of his treasures, but but you know he only knows what's not there when it, when when it's not there. Not necessarily when like because it's there all the time. So he, you know. I would definitely help a dragon move, and I think they would need help with that. It's interesting how you interpreted this question. Because because of my narcissism, when it said comes to you for help, I thought, okay, what would the dragon need from me specifically? So I'm like, I guess I'm running his social media presence. Or I'm co-hosting his <laughs> podcast. Or doing something of that nature. Or like ghostwriting his memoirs. So when the question went to you, I thought you'd be like, oh, well, obviously I would be cooking him meals to keep him placated so he doesn't kill us all. So it's amusing to me. You're like, oh, yeah, a dragon would need help moving. Where I'm like, oh, yeah, I could help a dragon bring their PR game to the next level. <laughs> and thank you for our question submitter. Your digital deluxe copy of the Waltz of Blades will be in your email. And next up, our random non-dragon question of the week. What is your theme song? Um, my theme song, yep. uh, I, uh, I, I wrote one myself, although oddly enough, I, I no longer have the original, uh, she write it, but, <clears throat> but I, I actually went through a stint where I was trying to write lots of people theme songs and some of them stuck, some of them didn't, but, uh, my theme song, I, I definitely hum it to myself sometimes when I'm bored. I know at one point you wrote me a theme song and... Uh, you, you didn't really like it because it was too heavily inspired by Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, that's fair. So, my current, my, whatever theme song I have is usually based on what I'm listening to while I'm working on something or making something. Like, the Mega Man Zero soundtrack is used a lot while I'm working. But at the moment, mm. after revisiting Bleach, because despite the fact I rant about it in every episode, a new season's coming up and I need to be prepared with fresh criticisms. 
Ichigo's theme song where it just dramatically screams in English, now you feel like number one. I kind of want to co-op that into my theme song. Because I just love the energy behind. It's like a song pretty much about being a pop star that's used to fight monsters, and it's fantastic. I, I definitely agree uh, that that would be a fantastic uh, song to claim as, as your theme song. It's definitely a very catchy, uh, pump you up kind of tune. I mean, also to date my age a bit, another contenders, three contenders are Highway to the Danger Zone, Eye of the Tiger, <laughs> and... <laughs> wow, my brain just blanked on the third one. But you get the idea. The final countdown? Thank you. That was correct, yes. <laughs> Pretty much anything they would use in the Cobra Kai soundtrack is probably a contender. Yeah, all right. And with that... Well, uh, thanks, thanks everyone for, for tuning in. I uh, hope you uh, feel more informed about uh, what kinds of uh, genres of, of books you're going to read and find a few mysteries and, and post them for us to see uh, what kind of mysteries you guys have been interested in, what you thought was a good whodunit. I agree completely. Feel free to fill in those comments with your favorite murder mysteries and least favorite murder mysteries and things that had a murdery mystery in them for absolutely no discernible reason. Take care and have a good one. Bye. Bye.